This episode of the Gondrepreneur Podcast is made possible by 420 friendly service providers in the Gondrepreneur Business Directory. If you need professional help with your business, from accounting to legal services to consulting, marketing, payment processing, or insurance, visit gondrepreneur.com slash businesses to find service providers who specialize in helping cannabis entrepreneurs like you. Visit the Gondrepreneur Business Directory today at gondrepreneur.com slash businesses. Hey there, I'm your host, T.G. Brandfault, and you are listening to the Gondrepreneur.com podcast, where we try to bring you actionable information and normalize cannabis through the stories of gondrepreneurs, activists, and industry stakeholders. Today, I'm joined by Dr. John Cachet. He's the Director of Laboratory Science and Undergraduate Research at Hawking College. He's the first two-time guest on the Gondrepreneur.com podcast. He was instrumental in setting up the college's program, which has a license to test cannabis under the Ohio Medical Cannabis Program, and helped develop the curriculum for a new associate's degree program at Hawking College in laboratory sciences that will encompass three specialized majors, including cannabis lab technician. It's a mouthful, man. You have a lot going on. How are you? Good, good, TJ. Pleasure to be back, man. I didn't realize that I was the first... uh double time guests i feel like i should be getting a green jacket and a cigar or something like that it's in the mail at least at least the cigar is uh so so as as we've said you know we've been on the show before uh but for those of you who didn't listen to that uh episode uh just tell us a bit about your background man yeah so i have a phd in neuroscience uh during graduate school i had a dea license uh to obtain and research schedule one through four drugs while I was in Northern California doing my postdoc at UC Davis, uh, it was about the time that California was transitioning from a collective medical cannabis program uh, to a business license medical program. And so I was uh, pretty well involved in the politics and the formation of those political regulations, uh, became involved with a group out there doing cultivation research, uh, looking at making indoor cultivation a little bit more efficient and cost effective than what it was uh, and still is at the time, um, but also spent a lot of time in politics. And being an Ohioan, I was uh, very closely following the development of the Ohio program um, and eventually found myself back in Ohio. Ohio, uh, with a you know a little bit less of a greenhorn, and able to uh, get involved. So, when you were one of the first guests on the podcast, you're working in the private sector, working on a more cultivator face project that you had mentioned. Uh, what led you to make the switch, uh, you know, to education focus? You know, really, when I got back to Ohio, the headlines at that point said. No major public institutes of higher education signaling interest in becoming a testing lab. Uh, uh, HB 523, the legislation that kicked off the Ohio Medical Marijuana Control Program, mandated that for the first year, testing was to be done at an institute of higher education, a public institute. Um, I had experience in the cannabis industry. I had a knowledge and just passion uh, for cannabis and cannabis culture, um, and also happened to have a PhD in neuroscience. Uh, so really, um, no universities has decided to step up. I was someone who uh, was qualified to take charge of a testing lab. Um, I knew Ohio State wasn't going to do it. I knew the University of Cincinnati wasn't going to do it. My alma mater is a private liberal arts college. They weren't even eligible. Uh, and so really, it was a, a bit of a traveling uh, roadshow to different uh, community colleges starting up north um, and eventually landing down here at Hawking to say, look, um, there are no testing labs. The uh, future of the program is uh, unknown and in jeopardy at this point. Uh, would you be interested in applying to be a testing lab? Uh, Hawking uh, was really quickly able to get the provost and the president together. And I'll never forget what the president said, you know, after I had sort of given the spiel, uh, she looked down and then looked up at everybody in the room and basically said, you know, look, it doesn't really matter 
what each of us personally think about the use of cannabis uh, uh, in a medicinal way. Uh, the state of Ohio has set a mandate that public institutes of higher education need to perform independent third party testings. We should at least, you know, give it a shot. Um, so from there, basically, I was able to develop the application, uh, get it turned in in time, um, and we are here today. That's it's really interesting that not not all colleges were uh, qualified to uh, enter the program. What were some of the challenges for you personally in helping to create the new degree program specifically for cannabis lab technicians, and and what's in that cur curriculum? Yeah, yeah, it's it's a, it's a great question. You know, really. In terms of uh, what other universities would, were saying, right, to this idea of should we participate in the cannabis industry, two years ago, um, I'm very familiar with higher uh, institutes of higher education. I've been in several across the country for most of my adult life. There's a term called analysis paralysis. Um, and so there was a perceived risk that if we touch this plant, the federal government may take away all of our uh, federal research money. They may cut our ability to offer financial aid to students. Um, and, I, you know, the emphasis on there is perceived risk because that's never happened. Um, but just the potential of that being on the table would lead to so much, you know, paralysis and analyzing all the different options uh, that most universities just walk away. Um, so now in terms of the coursework, yeah, it was actually pretty challenging if you go from it of the angle that a course like this in cannabis has never existed before. Um, and I, I should say a curriculum rather than a course. You know, there are a number of universities, uh, Canadian, Colorado, some in California now, um, some even in Ohio. For, for example, the, the Ohio, Ohio State the Ohio State University Law School has, you know, one course where they will review cannabis and its relation to tax law. Um, but what we developed here at Hawking, what I developed here at Hawking is actually a full two year uh, program uh, curriculum uh, where at the end students will walk away with an associate's degree uh, in, in lab sciences with a major in cannabis lab technician. Um, so what would that look like? Well, obviously, they need experience on the analytical chemistry portion of it. And we make no um, no qualms about it. While cannabis is this, you know, in, involved in this program and we will be analyzing cannabis, uh, it's a very uh, hardcore analytical chemistry program. We're learning how to run high pressure liquid chromatography. We're learning how to run inductively coupled mass spectrometers as te tests for heavy metals. Um, so obviously you need that uh, type of coursework, which consists of both, you know, classroom time uh, to get the theory uh, behind the instrumentation, but then also lab time, hands on time uh, with the exact instruments that are being used in our commercial cannabis lab, uh, just in an educational lab. Um, and while we're not uh, able to take, uh, obviously, cannabis products that are in the product supply supply line over to the educational lab, we are able to use standards and extracts um, because it's in very, very important for the students to look at the same chromatography peaks, the same sort of patterns over and over and over again. I mean, in particular, you know, I got a question, what's the test going to be like? In the lab, you know, we'll have, let's say, 10 samples and we want to analyze the cannabinoid content of what's in these 10 liquid samples. Unbeknownst to the students, I've spiked three of them with aspirin and caffeine. Huh. Um, I'll know who's paying attention. I'll know who's going to make a, gra a great cannabis lab tech. When they call me over and say, this peak shouldn't be here, I don't know what this peak is. And it's like, okay, now you're finally getting it. You got it. Um, so there's the chemistry angle of the curriculum for this major. Beyond that, 
I wanted to make these students prepare just to work in the cannabis industry in general. And so we're going to, you know, provide an overview of humans history with this plant. I call it cannabis humans and our forgotten history, um, because we are lucky enough to have the cannabis museum, uh, cannabismuseum.com down the street for us. It's the largest private collection of old pharmacy uh, mixing jars from compounding pharmacies. You know, they have things that go back as far as 1880. 87 uh, handwritten prescriptions from doctors in Texas for two grams of cannabis indica to help with insomnia. So, you know, where the cannabis industry has come from, what's our relationship with this plant in humanity's perspective, and where are we going? Um, and then the last most, you know, the last important component that is important for a lab tech, yes, but important for anybody in the cannabis industry in general is understanding the economics of being a cultivator. So what's their business model look like? You know, what are the inputs that go into growing plants successfully of high quality repeatedly in our new modern regulated system? What does a grower stay up at night worrying about? You know, what are microclimates and how do microclimates lead to situations where eventually downstream, they're going to end up failing one of the tests and have to destroy that whole crop? The same thing goes for processors. What's their business model? What are they starting with as raw material? What are the steps it goes through to get down to a medicinal quality oil? And then what are their goals in terms of using that oil and turning it into different products? Because ultimately, as a lab tech, uh, you're going out to these operations and you're spending time with the grower who has spent the last couple months, uh, certainly the last uh, three or four weeks of flowering, with these plants every day, you know, and has an intimate relationship with them. And he's talking to you about his concerns. He's asking you questions about like, I might've seen a little PM over here. What do you think? And so the, you know, it's important for the labs tech and the students that are going to be coming out of this program to have an appreciation and be able to put themselves in someone else's shoes for a day to help them achieve their goals while also being very well versed in the regulations and the analytical chemistry involved in cannabis testing. I mean, it's no surprise, you know, I, I know you uh, are really sort of deep thinker and, and that you've put a lot of thought into this. Um, you know, you've spent most of your adult life in higher education. Um, you know, I, I have a master's degree. I, I currently teach at a, at a New York State uh, school, university. And I can tell you that my, my during my interview, during my first semester, I didn't really mention much my relationship to the cannabis industry as a journalist, as someone who has covered it for a long time, uh, because that stigma still exists uh, where I'm at, you know, upstate New York. It's a little, little more conservative. Um, how important do you think it is that a traditional institute of higher education has this program focused on the cannabis industry? You know, higher education is in the business of preparing students for a career, for their job, you know? And so um, there's clearly a demand um, in, in both across all ages, both uh, uh, young and old students to try to find an avenue into the cannabis industry. And you know, even up to today, really, uh, the best way to get experience in the cannabis industry is break the law left and right and, you know, put you and your family and your finances and your children and everything at uh, such a risk that, you know, it really becomes difficult for someone who, you know, let's say they are retiring from their job and they were great in the manufacturing floor, but they, you know, they, they know that the cannabis labs are driving around the state every day and they want to get involved, but he doesn't know much about cannabis. It is really the, um, the mission of traditional institutes of higher education to provide pathways to prosperity uh, for these individuals. I mean, down here in Southern Ohio uh, is a great example. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with being a car mechanic. And if you're a good car mechanic, I love you. And it's an honorable profession. But you could now conceivably 
have a career in, in biomedical research, performing graduate level analytical chemistry uh, after a two year program and a lot of hands on experience um, at, at this program at Hawking College. And I will say this, too, just to wrap. Um, you know, after Hawking College sort of plowed the way through, um, I get about a, a email a week from different institutes of higher education, you know, Kentucky, West Virginia, um, up in Canada, where they're saying, we have a medical program coming online. Uh, we saw what you guys did. And of course, our students are very interested in preparing themselves for this industry you know, can you tell us how you did it? Can you tell us how uh, cannabis and higher education can exist uh, together uh, in a way where there's mutual benefits um, all around? So you've mentioned, you know, a couple of times the students. Tell me about the students that you're seeing in this program. Are they mostly your traditional sort of fresh out of high school types or are they your non-traditional, maybe part time adult learners? Uh, it's a good question, and the interest has been across the board. Um, broadly speaking, um, there are uh, high school graduates who are, you know, going off to college for the first time and want to jump on this as soon as they can. Um, the other half are, you know, individuals with uh, degrees already. You know, maybe they already have a Bachelor of Science. Um, maybe they already have. Uh, they're a certified nurse practitioner or they're a medical lab technician. They already have an accredited degree um, in an advanced field of study, but they want to come back. They want to get the cannabis experience so they can get lined up for a job in the cannabis space. Um, and so, you know, it's been real interesting for me to figure out how I can take a program and these students who are coming in at vastly different levels of knowledge and experience uh, and get them through uh, the end result, which really for me um, is positive feedback from employers down the road that the people coming out of this program are not only well prepared, but they are fantastic and they've been able to help our lab, you know, over several hurdles or small fires that, that, that pop up daily. Um, Generally, you know, I mean, we get emails from students in Texas. I've gotten emails from students in Washington state. I really wow. did have uh, a 68 year old man call me who said he hasn't saved enough for retirement and he wants to know how to get into the program. Um, no way. And so interest is coming all over, the, you know, across the board, all over the nation. Uh, really, what I try to do right off the bat is to make sure that they're clear that this is an analytical chemistry program in which cannabis is the primary target analyte. Uh, there will be no organoleptic testing by any means. Uh, organoleptic meaning, of course, testing a product with your five senses. So you mentioned earlier, you know, at the start uh, about these other sort of canna-centric schools, uh, you know, that are in California and Colorado and, and so forth. Um, why would you recommend that students enroll in a program like yours or your program uh, instead of other cannabis focused institutions? You know, are there and are there benefits to those other less traditional schools? Of course. Yes. Yeah. So there, there are several um, entities, one here in Ohio, which I sit on the advisory board of the Cleveland School of Cannabis, for example, they offer uh, certificate programs after, you know, it's a, it's a short program, I think maybe over the course of like uh, six to eight weeks, and then you can end up uh, getting a certificate from them uh, in cultivation, or you could end up getting a certificate from them in processing or working in the dispensary. Um, those schools um, are first off, you know, responding to a demand of people who want to be educated to work in the industry. Um, but you'll notice the traditional institutes of higher education, you know, we are training people to be cannabis lab technicians or to work in the analytical chemistry angle of it. You could work at a cultivator or a processor who has this instrumentation on site. Um, but I think it's going to be some time before we see a traditional academic institution actually teaching cannabis cultivation or actually teaching how to extract uh, with, with butane or some other hydrocarbon, extract that down into an oil and then make that oil into products. You know, th those are um, 
I think, you know, a little bit too much. I'm, I don't know what the legal term would be, but like maybe aiding and abetting uh, federal <laughs> rule breaking. Um, but they're very comfortable, uh, you know, with the analytical chemistry part of it. So you can, exp- you know, this is an, an accredited degree program here at, at Hawking. You will walk away with an associate's degree in cannabis lab technician. That's a two year program. Uh, my job is to make sure that that program is rigorous enough to when you apply to be a cannabis lab tech. And they are saying that we want oh, a bachelor's or master's or PhD. You can say, well, I've been in a cannabis lab for a year and a half. You know, I know what when the ICPMS goes down and the vents messed up, that it's really the drain pipe. It's not really the vent. <laughs> that knowledge is invaluable. Um, but the, if you know for sure that you want to be on the cultivation side of things, dealing with the plants, our program will prepare you to have those conversations, but you're not getting the hands on nitty gritty details of how that process works. So I hope I made that clear, but you know, there's different avenues in which educational entities are targeting things now. And chemistry is the, I don't want to say the safest lane, but it's, it's one of the, one of, it's one of the lanes that requires um, the finesse and experience and educational philosophy that you would find in a traditional two or four year education beyond that of a certificate program. So I want to ask you sort of a, a broad question here. Um, you know, you you went around trying to find places to uh, help set up a degree program in in Ohio. Uh, you ultimately landed on one. Um, you know, you, you mentioned that we're very far away from seeing cultivation for, you know, probably uh, legal reasons as opposed to cultural reasons. Right. Um, in your experience, do you think that there is still a can of bias in higher education, you know, that it's something that, you know, we don't want to talk about with students that, you know, uh, department chairs don't talk about, you know, sort of the culture aspect of it with uh, their faculty and so on and so forth? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I don't know if I would call it a can of bias. I would say more like can of phobic. Uh, they're <laughs> okay. afraid. They're afraid to touch it. I mean, for so long. It has been a, even at the schools, you know, an issue that law enforcement handles, you know, not the provost and dean of academic affairs. Um, I don't think this is unique to higher education, um, but there is just in large um, people who have preconceived notions of what cannabis is and what it does and the people who use it and who they are and how they behave. Um, but, you know, even since last we spoke, you know, you could see that sort of getting whittled away, um, you know, day by day. And really, it's conversation by conversation. You know, I tell everybody, if you're talking to someone, call it cannabis. Don't call it marijuana. Marijuana is some made up term. You know, we're actually using its scientific name. Um, when I first started here at the school down here in, in, in southern Ohio, you know, there was a lot of once you get past the, you know, sort of, you know, can of stoner jokes and then you start getting into the real <laughs> science of it. You know, they're like, oh, wait, you know, this kid's not playing around. He's actually serious about this. Then there's also sort of just responding to, oh, well, you know, I know this medical is just a Trojan horse in order to get to adult use and no one's really, you know, ben- benefiting medically for that reason and that reason alone. I purchased several copies of um, the most recent compendium of the medical uses of cannabis, it's about a 600 page book. I mean, it's like a Bible. So whenever I get that question, I can just throw that book at them and say, come back to me after you've read it. And and injure them in, a, in the process. <laughs> um, with, with Hawking, are, are you guys partnering with private companies as part of your programs? Uh, yeah, definitely. So, I mean, uh, the one that comes to mind first is Shimatsu. Um, so all of our analytical instrumentation, uh, was provided by Shimatsu. Um, they have been a wonderful partner to have, uh, especially in helping us get the lab up and running quickly. You know, they were one of the first major analytical chemistry equipment manufacturers to service and get into cannabis testing labs. Um, so with that comes a lot of experience in tuning the LC triple quad to detect microbutanol and Sinusat A and 20 other pesticides along with, you know, mycotoxins and the fungus 
business. And so we were really able to uh, benefit from the experience that they've gotten in setting up other cannabis labs uh, to ensure that the signal to noise ratios and the recovery percentages that we're getting um, were right on track right off the bat right away. Um, And if we do have something uh, that is slightly off, uh, that we're able to call, uh, you know, the, one of their texts directly, um, because we are a, a partner, uh, Shimatsu partner analytical lab with them. And so they're very, you know, very much vested in our success as well. Um, beyond that, um, you know, there are medical device manufacturers down here in Southeast Ohio who are interested in production line biochemists. You know, they make things like pregnancy tests and other sort of testing, me- medical testing kits. Um, so there are definitely outside of the cannabis industry uh, companies who are looking for staff and need a, a lab sciences, uh, you know, coursework for the education. Um, we're also partnering uh, with groups like uh, Pathogen DX and Medicinal Genomics. Uh, these companies make uh, genetic-based, PCR-based uh, microbial tests. So in our tests that we're testing for mold, uh, right now, in order to test for mold, we have to uh, swab the sample onto a cell culture plate and, and put it in an incubator for 24 hours and then check after 48 and give it an enrichment and put it in for another 48. You know, it could take up to 90 hours plus. Um, and it's really the biggest bottleneck in the cannabis analytical lab pipeline. By using the genetic methods, such as those put out by pathogen and medicinal, um, we're able to cut that time down to about six hours, uh, but we are also able to genetically identify the presence of a mold uh, or a fungus rather than just looking at the cell count and say, well, there's there's blue growth here with a red air bubble, and that indicates uh, 100 colonies of enterobacteria. Um, You know, the bacteria can be a lot different, and depending on what actually is there, um, or if the, the operation is using some sort of composting teas, which is, you know, very popular outdoor and, um, you know, in the sort of black market transition over. So we're working with those uh, private uh, kit providers with the DNA methods to ensure that those results that come out match those on the plate. And it's, you know, it's some R&D testing for them, but then also to go to the state and say, look, these are valid methods for detecting microbial growth, if not more accurate than what the plates are. Um, And it would be worth uh, everybody's time for us to switch over. Um, so yeah, there are you know a number of private public partnerships that we have going on. Um, the lab, of course, itself is owned entirely by the school. Uh, the revenue streams that come in from the lab are then being able to go back into the general fund and support any number, you know, the the whole catalog of programs here at the college. Um, But the manufacturers know, especially that we have the educational component, people like to purchase the machines that they were trained on. And so getting them in front of the students is of equal value to everyone, um, not to mention the students who are being trained on some of the, you know, latest and greatest uh, analytical instrumentation. So a lot of colleges throughout the country are, are facing sort of budget cuts, budget crises, um, you know, and, and so in, in order to set up one of these programs, I mean, obviously it, it costs some money um, and, and how, you know, could, could other interested uh, educators um, sort of get Get, create these partnerships? You know, what was that process like? Did they reach out to you? Did you reach out to them? Um, it was mostly a lot of outreach on my end. Um, you know, having spent so much time in academia, uh, particularly in grad school, for example, you know, when we were giving zebrafish LSD um, and trying to uh, discern their behavior, whether it was an anxiety like state or Um, you know, a more sort of calm state. Uh, One of the ways that I developed to do that was to use USB web cameras and then plug it in, plug those videos into um, animal behavioral tracking software. And so at that point, no one was doing that with zebrafish. The software was designed to be working with mice and rodents. And so I have a lot of experience working on uh, software and adapting software into the laboratory setting in new ways. And so I knew what it was like to contact uh, those private companies, um, 
as an academic, you know, institution uh, and discuss to them what we have going on and if they would like to be involved. Um, for other universities, you know, they, sh they should also be intimately familiar with that. There are some benefits, um, particularly when it comes to negotiating, you know, pricing and service contracts and, and all of that, that the manufacturers and private companies um, are familiar with the, the benefits and the value of working very closely with higher education. Um, the other institutions that have called me uh, and asked how they could get their foot in the door you know, really, it's starting to get familiar with your regulations. You know, what does the testing lab actually look like in your state? And, you know, I can't tell you, I could tell you all about Ohio, California, um, but not Kentucky. You know, I didn't even know Kentucky had a program. Um, so getting involved, reading those regulations, attending any and all of you know the public meetings that the uh, government is hosting here in Ohio, we, they have a monthly meeting in Columbus where the Medical Marijuana Advisory Board meets, um, and you know it probably wouldn't be a bad idea as well uh, to attend uh, local meetings. You know your local normal chapter, or if there's an ASA program at your school, um, or Students for Sensible Drug Policy. You know, that is where you're going to start finding champions, um, those who who understand cannabis and cannabis culture, but also have a technical enough background or experience to where you want to start recruiting those people and getting them on your side. Um, I think Dr. Young often says that, you know, when they when asked how this all came about at Hawking, she looks at me and said, JC was here and he knew what he was doing. Um, whether, uh, whether that's true or not, we've made it this far, um, but really starting early, getting out there, um, especially with like departments of higher eds, if you're planning on doing a curriculum, you know, you surely have a, a relationship with them, but starting to float the idea of, of some cannabis curriculum that might be being submitted. Uh, you're lucky that you have Hawking to, to, to look to, to say, well, this is how they did it. Um, but it really is a lot of discussions and not putting things off to the last minute is, is what is eventually going to uh, help you win the marathon. It's not a race. So you, you touched on uh, policy a minute ago. Let's talk a little bit about Midwest policy. Uh, Michigan's legalized cannabis for adult use. Uh, Illinois governor has said he wanted to actually beat Michigan to roll out their own program. Uh, Ohio's in the Midwest, obviously. Uh, how long, in your opinion, um, until officials in Ohio seriously take a look at recreational use, considering what's going on around them. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting. I think actually Pennsylvania announced some intent for adult use laws here pretty quickly. Um, I think, and I think this is very understandably so, the regulators in Ohio, um, especially since we just had a, a new governor come into place um, and the delays that weren't unique to Ohio, um, but we're basically at a point now where the entire program has actually only been up and running uh, with products on the shelves for three or four weeks. You know, we, we finally got all the pieces connected and we have product moving from cultivators to dispensary shelves. And I know that there are, um, you know, considerations and amendments just to improve the current laws that we have on the book. I know that, at least in the new governor's office, there is um, sort of an acceptance of the medical laws, but very little interest in expanding those laws over to adult use. Um, but what I will say, I know several groups, and I'm, I'm pretty sure there's one out of Athens that has adult use ballot language ready um, to get on the ballot in 2020. And if history is any judge... Um, the thing that will get Ohio legislators moving very quickly is uh, a ballot initiative that the people put forth. Um, it's the same thing that happened with our medical laws here. We had uh, the the uh, heralded and, and infamous uh, monopoly bill for the medical laws here in Ohio. That got voted down quickly. And then all of a sudden, the Ohio legislature passed a medical cannabis program uh, at lightning speed, faster than any states has ever done it before. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how everything falls out. You know, it's also interesting to consider the fact now that we have several multi-million dollar businesses that have spent a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of effort to be operational in the 
medical uh, market? And, you know, are those business interests not interested in adult use or are they interested in adult use? I think, and I, and I, you know, understandably so that in the legislature, we're not going to see any movement on adult use unless it, the, the people of Ohio force the issue. Um, and ultimately, you know, I think it's going to come. Um, but I do think that I would like to see the p- medical program here in Ohio um, get, you know, right, there's like maybe 30 percent of the production line and production capacity is actually moving right now. You know, by the a year from now, by the time we're in the summer, uh, we'll see a lot more product moving through the, the supply chain. We'll see prices come down. Um, and frankly, I hope we see the trend where the average age of uh, patients at dispensaries is, is is 50 plus. And so those people really stand to benefit a lot. So, you know, of course, the appetite's there. Um, I don't know if the political w- will will be there until the people force the issue. I would certainly say it's not out of the question, but it's hard to predict at this point. So what advice do you have for potential students seeking to enter this space? And and what about educators? Yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. Well, like I like I said at the beginning, the advice to potential students is, yes, this is a cannabis program. But more than that, it is a very rigorous analytical chemistry program. And so if you don't have the innate curiosity, curiosity, um, in how things work or, you know, sort of an engineering tinkering mind, um, or math is in your thing, or, you know, some level of physics just drives you crazy. Um, you're probably not going to make it through the entire program. Um, I, I learned at other universities, you know, a lot of freshmen will come in their first year and say they want to major in psychology. It's one of the most popular, uh, freshman choices, first year choices, um, in order to handle that, Psychology 101 is a pretty difficult course, you know, by design to make sure that the people didn't just willy nilly pick psychology, but are willing to put in the work um, to achieve what is a, a relatively difficult degree. Uh, so, my advice to students is that, you know, be aware that this is a rigorous program and it's going to you know remain that way because you need those skills and that experience um, in order to get a position you know in this industry um, the other thing i guess i would say is that you know for educators your goal is to p- prepare students for jobs in the workforce so one of the things i didn't mention earlier if you do have legal cannabis operations operating, it would serve you very well to ask if you could set up a meeting with them on site, you know, go through their processes, make those connections with where the potential employers are um, in your state and understand what they want from a student, uh, you know, coming out and looking for a job at their facility, for example. Um, the last thing I'll leave you with too, and I had, I, you know, I do this with, with all of my, uh, interviews for the lab or anyone, uh, that calls me from a school looking to set up an educational program like this. The very first question is, uh, sort of like when the stewardess goes around and checks, uh, the exit doors and you got to give them a visual nod and confirmation that you're willing to open the door should you need to, uh, you just say flatly, we're all going to be felons. Are you uh, prepared to break federal law? And you say yes. You move on, and you don't you don't discuss it again until uh, hopefully you never need to. Um, but it's just something that you have to accept, live with, and uh, hopefully your your uh, your support for states' rights and the ability for the states to regulate the system is is good enough. Is that when most people hang up on you? <laughs> uh, it's where most people sort of just stare at me like, wait a second, is he serious or is he joking around? And it's this is very much serious. You know, it's not uh, I guess it's not something to be proud of uh, in one way. But in in another way, you know, the cannabis industry has only, always been a group of outlaws. Um, and while we're legal now, we're still breaking a few laws just by technicality. Um, but hopefully the more people get that get in, the more students that are uh, educated in this, the, the more and more we'll push back against that uh, canna bias or canna phobia uh, and get to a point where, you know, where everything should be. 
So where can people find out more about you, your program? How can they get in touch with you uh, if they're seeking answers uh, to their educational questions? So uh, you can reach the lab at lab at hocking.edu. Hocking is spelled H-O-C-K. I N G. Um, I will say this, we've, you know, given the interest in the program, um, my inbox is just dead on arrival. Um, so for anybody <laughs> who has maybe already emailed me or, um, is hoping to learn more about the program, please don't take my lack of response, uh, personally at all. Uh, it's just that this is a very, uh, very popular program and there's a lot of students that are interested. Um, I'm trying to pull up the laboratory sciences. Yeah. So if you go to, um, hocking.edu slash laboratory dash sciences, that's where you can see, uh, the full curriculum for the program. Um, a little bit more about the chemical and medical laboratory programs. Um, and, you know, reach out to admissions or enrollment uh, to learn about how you can get started. The first class is actually starting March 10th. Um, and then lastly, you can find us on social media at Hocking Lab Sci. So H-O-C-K-I-N-G-L-A-B-S-C-I. And that's on uh, Twitter and Instagram. One, one more quick question. Do you, do you guys already have a wait list? Uh, we have not set up a wait list. There is a cap on the lecture classes at 100. There's a cap on the laboratory classes at 25. Uh, my mailing list is currently at 207, um, and I'm pretty sure we've got about 30 enrolled thus far. Uh, March 10th is the first intro to lab sciences, so that would be for students both interested in cannabis, chemical, and medical lab technicians. The cannabis-specific courses, the first year for that will be in the fall of 2019. Um, and then for those of you that have a bachelor's degree or other sort of advanced training, uh, if your credits transfer, you can start uh, in the second year of courses, which will be going in full uh, fall of 2020. Well, Dr. John Cachet, man, it's really great to have you back. Um, you know, congratulations uh, on all of your success with this program and just in the industry in general. Uh, it's always great to to have a chat with you, and I know that you're super busy, so it's a good thing that I have your cell phone number because I wouldn't have been able to get in contact with you had I sent me an email. Of course, of course, CJ. Yeah, always a pleasure to chat, and uh, I guess I owe you a beer this time. <laughs> Next time you come up to the Adirondacks. You can find more episodes of the Gontrepreneur.com podcast in the podcast section of Gontrepreneur.com and in the Apple iTunes store. On the Gontrepreneur.com website, you will find the latest cannabis news and cannabis jobs updated daily, along with transcripts of this podcast. You can also download the Gontrepreneur.com app in iTunes and Google Play. This episode was engineered by Trim Media House. I've been your host, T.G. Brandfall. 